so I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Sensei Robert Frager, uh, who most of you were here last time in it, and uh, what a wonderful session it was. You are now the record holder, Bob, for the number of biggest viewings over the year by about 200, so well done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite where the conversation will go, but I know, know where it's going to start. So the big question we want to ask is... So what has love got to do with Aikido, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Ever since uh, watching over and over again, the American media kept replaying the rioting in Washington, D.C. of January 6th. Uh, it's as though there's no creativity on television. Some of you may have noticed that. Um, and they just kept showing the same footage over and over again. But it really was very, very striking to me. And I started thinking about <clears throat> violence, which I think um, we tend to ignore in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. Um, and then, of course, there's a natural tie-in to Aikido as a Budo. Uh, one could say simply the job of, uh, uh, of a good Budo is to handle violence effectively, if you will. Um, Osensei, and I, I think I mentioned this last time, Osensei wrote that Budo wa ainari, Budo is love. Um, and he left us to figure out what that meant. Uh, and everybody has, I think, a different take on it. Uh, in thinking about violence, I mean, I came across the wonderful saying of Picasso, which is the first act of creativity is always an act of destruction. Uh, we don't think about that. You know, that uh, in order to, to truly be creative, you have to, in a sense, let go of the past, otherwise you keep repeating it. Um, so that's one, that's one way in to say violence is part of life. Um, a great psychologist, Fritz Perls, wrote a book called, I think it's Ego, Hunger, and Aggression. And he argued that aggression, the roots of the word aggression have to do with chewing, to chew your food. You do violence. <laughs> to what you put in your mouth by chewing it and breaking it up, uh, or you'd starve to death. So that in one sense, violence is, is an essential part of life. Um, I mean, you could swallow your food whole, but then you wouldn't digest it properly, or you choke to death. Those are two not uh, ideal. And I'm, I'm deeply, I, I keep thinking of the fact that Osensei had two extraordinary teachers who were in some ways polar opposites. He, he had Shokaku Takeda on one side, who was thought of as the last samurai. With all that that implied, I mean, he was a warrior who always carried a weapon and used it. I mean, he was in uh, duels. Um, he carried a, a razor sharp tanto under his kimono, uh, put in, you know, the Japanese used to wear what's called a haramaki, a belly band, um, which goes back to the days that samurai were horsemen. And unless you supported your, your belly, your kidneys and your stomach muscles would suffer if you're on a horse all day. So Japanese, including when I was in Japan in the 60s, and um, I think even today, many Japanese will wear this band around their belly, even in the summer. And imagine you've got this, this belly band wrapped around several times, and you stick a live razor-sharp tanto in it. That's what he did. 
he didn't bother with a sheath because the tanto might hang up on the sheath when you whip it out <laughs> to defend yourself. <clears throat> so he, he had small cuts all over his stomach because, uh, you know, carry, carry a razor sharp knife against your skin, um, you're going to cut yourself. Uh, that's just one example of his approach. He was paranoid, as in a sense a serious warrior might be. Um, he would not allow someone to prepare food and serve food to him if he didn't know them. In fact, he insisted Osensei prepare all his food when Osensei became a disciple of his. It's a very bizarre way to live. Um, and many of us know people who came back from combat who were, had to regain being human. They, they were living on edge and if something sudden happened, they would respond with violence because that's what saved their lives in, if you're in combat. Did you have to oh. serve, Bob? Did you ever have to uh, go, go into the forces? No, no, I avoided all that. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know, know that. Uh, however, I have trained with people in Japan who really treated every single waza, every single encounter on the mat as re a real life attack, life and death. I mean, not quite. It, it was a little bit better than than that. In the old days, that's exactly what they did. There were lots of broken bones in Aikido, um, which we seem to have avoided these days, thank God. Um, so there's Takeda on the, on the one hand. Takeda was also incredibly sensitive. He, he could tell if someone, his character wasn't right and he wouldn't teach them. Um, even when he was scheduled to teach at, uh, he went up to Hokkaido where he met Osensei and he taught martial arts classes. And he would say to the police chief, no, you got to throw him out because I, I, I don't like his character. So that was another piece to that art. You know, if you remember things like the seven samurai, samurai were expected to have an extraordinary sensitivity to other people, to the world around them. But it was in the service of effective violence. It wasn't in the service of peace and love. On the other hand, there was Deguchi uh, Onisaburo, um, and he was the spiritual teacher to Osensei. And he was an extraordinary spiritual teacher. There's, there's a particular, I've had a lot of spiritual teachers in my life from a lot of traditions. And so I understand the dynamics probably more than most people. Um, Deguchi was what's called sort of the um, master of so sort of crazy wisdom. You never knew what he would do. You know, um, he was quite extraordinary. He was a gifted artist. He was a gifted poet, writer. Um, he was incredibly brave and outspoken. This is before World War II, when the basically the military class who all lived according to the samurai code in their own understandings, um, they ran the country, and he got up and said, you know, we really need to seek peace. War is wrong as a spiritual teacher. He also said, we should no longer have Amaterasu no Omikami, the sun goddess, as the supreme deity in, in Shinto, because that's only for the Japanese people. And if you're going to have a real religion with a god, a god in charge, as it were, a, a kami, a deity, I suppose, it should be for all humanity. And so he proposed that, I think it was Ushin Toro no Mikami, a male god for all humanity. Well, that made everybody in Shinto hate him. 
uh, it's not quite as bad as you know some Christian minister saying, "Forget Jesus, we need to have another <laughs> um, great teacher we're going to follow." Um, so he was he was extraordinarily courageous. Nobody was teaching that all humanity you know, has the same God and we're all the same, you know, in the eyes of God. This was back, you know, in the 30s. Um, nobody was, look, in, in America, even up till now, saying, you know, saying we're in favor of peace is enough to get people thrown in jail, or certainly <laughs> our, our police would simply beat the hell out of them. So he was way ahead of his time. And uh, Osensei dearly loved him and was his attendant. I mean, traveled with him, sort of carried his bags, was in effect his bodyguard because Osensei was incredibly physically powerful and incredibly well-trained both by Takeda and others. So we've got these two poles We've got violence and we've got love. Uh, you know, we've got peace and we've got someone in favor of being very good at warfare. We have the same thing in Aikido. I mean, there, there's, there's a funny thing in Aikido. A lot of the Uchideshi came in. They were college kids. They uh, were very, had become very good at judo or kendo, which were practiced as sports they did not experience Budo. Um, and then we have the older generation, many of whom really had practiced some form of real martial arts. Arakawa you... Sensei, as some of you know, uh, the legend is he traveled up from Kyushu to Tokyo That's and every time he ran out of money, he would go to a karate dojo, challenge the teacher, uh, the tradition is this is called dojo breaking or dojo yabori. Um, Challenge, ask the teacher for a lesson. That was that was the way it was put. And the teacher would say, well, my, my best student will give you a lesson. And he would watch. And uh, Arakawa sensei would beat up the student and then say, may I have a lesson from you? And he would beat up the sensei. Now, this is, you know, you have no idea what their training is. I mean, you're putting your life on the line every time you do this. Uh, and um, he would beat the teacher, and then he would say, let's go to your office, and he would take the cash box and say, I give you back the dojo. I need money for traveling. That's the legend that I heard when I was in Tokyo. I, I really loved Arakawa Sensei. He was a wonderful man, great Aikido historian. And his classes were dangerous because he still taught with a certain kind of martial flavor. And he would come that close to breaking your wrist or something else. But he was so good that it was only that close. His students weren't as good. And so I stopped training in his classes. I was afraid they would hurt me, not him. I'll give you one example. He would do Kotegaishi uh, sort of like this. That was the movement. He would lead you forward and then snap back. Um, I also saw, and I was a white belt. I didn't know, you know, I had had training in judo and karate, but I, that was not much. Uh, I watched him and I thought, how nice. He's not focused on his partner the way some Aikido instructors are, you know, almost like you're posing for a, a samurai movie. He would look around with soft eyes as he was throwing, and he would kneel, pinning his uke, and he would look around very softly, as though to say, any of his friends want to try something? Um, and then I noticed the poor uke was choking. He's going, Ugh! because that was Arakawa's hand in his throat. pinching his air off. And, and yet Arakawa sensei was going, oh, hmm. You know, I mean, it's a very effective 
martial attitude, which I, I, I never saw quite that way in the other senior teachers. There was often more, more martial focus or something else. So he was a great martial artist, but for you, was, was that um, Aikido with love? Uh, no. Well, it, it, yes and no. I mean, it was Aikido with, I'm, uh, effectiveness comes first, but I don't need to make a show of it. So in some ways, I think he was very confident of the effectiveness of his Aikido. Again, the legend was someone asked him, oh, sensei, I hear you, you studied karate. He said, yes. He said, what school? And he said, after a short pause, many schools. <laughs> um, what many of you probably don't know, Saito Sensei, who I dearly loved and I studied a great deal with, especially my early years, uh, was an expert in shuriken jutsu, knife throwing, not a martial art of love. And he threw spikes. Let me see if I have there. This, this was made for me by Bill Witt, who is also, as you know, an old student of Saito Sensei's. There, um, it's like, like a leaf-shaped blade, except it's round. The, the classic ones are actually octagonal. Bill just turned this out on a, a, a lathe. Um, and Saito Sensei told me that I was very skinny when I was a kid, he said. And gee, when I was in Aikido, they used to beat me up, which was so hard to believe. Um, and he said, so I learned Shuriken Jitsu and I learned the, the, this style, Negishi Ryu. Um, and he initiated me into the Ryu, which meant I signed his um, Kippan, the, the, um, the book of his Deshi, his disciples. The name before me was uh, someone named Chiba. The name after me was Bill Witt. So it wasn't everybody that studied with him. And when we threw Shuriken, the way he threw it was the spike would go in like you drove it with a mallet. Perfect 90 degree angle. So that was in his background. Um, Tada Sensei's family were old martial artists. I think it was uh, it was either spear or or uh, uh, archery. I forget which. I did meet once Tadashi Abe, who some of you have heard of, because there are legends about him. Uh, he went to France in a '52, um, and he was scary. I mean, just having tea with him sort of scared me. Um, and he he was known for like getting drunk and uh, getting in a fight in a bar and then sobering up by beating up the gendarmes who came and walking home. I don't know if that's true. These are just legends I was told, but he was clearly a martial artist of that particular variety. So um, many, many of our sensei students came from these other martial art backgrounds. And um, it's often said that many of those people sort of when, when asked what our sensei was talking about, we just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know, and just get on with practicing their martial art. Do you think that sowed the seeds for why maybe not everybody feels Aikido is about love? I think it's very difficult to overcome the tendencies in a culture that has deified the samurai, you know, really deified effective killing skills. You know, there's a, a famous saying uh, in, in Kenjutsu, one cut, one life. If you do anything else, it's just absurd. A real martial artist has to be that effective. You could translate that as, you know, one waza, one one. And, the, and, and everything is over because you have pinned or hospitalized or killed the person you're dealing with. Um, that's a brutal approach. On the other hand, 
I remember showing Aikido to my Sufi teacher, first time I met him, who was Turkish. Uh, I come from a Turkish Sufi lineage, and he was a huge, powerful man. I, someone commented, an old friend of mine said he had the largest hands he'd ever seen on a human being. And he was from two old warrior lineages. Um, and he watched me and I did a quote, spiritual Aikido soft and easy because I, you know, I didn't know he was a spiritual teacher. And the first thing he said is, well, you know, a real martial art, you have to be able to stop someone cold. You sort of one technique and it has to be over. Otherwise it's not a martial art. You have to be able to stop violence instantly. You have to have that capacity. So that's how he saw it. Um, it wasn't violent versus not violent is you have, if you're going to do a martial art, be effective so that you can save lives, you can stop violence. And that was a whole other approach. Um, one of my favorite teachers was Tojima Sensei, who was from Shingu. <clears throat> Tojima Sensei in some ways, his sword work was closer to O-sensei than almost anybody else. Um, he, he, rose, he, he raised the, uh, the sword or boken uh, minimally and cut down instantly. It wasn't this which comes from kendo, which is a sport and you can get away with this stuff because it's a sport. Uh, he, he would move so fast, I didn't see him throw a punch. What I saw was this. I saw the, 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 the hand coming out. I didn't see uh, coming back, not going out. Um, and one of the things he told me, he said, Bob, in a real fight, and he was echoing Arakawa Sensei's behavior. He said, you, you don't say, you don't... Uh, uh, you don't go into a kama. You don't go into a fancy stance. You don't say, I know Aikido, what, you know, fear me. You walk in, you grab them by the throat, and you take them down. You keep your hand in their throat. He said, that's what you do. Simple and effective. And uh, he did it once in the dojo. Someone uh, tried to attack him in the middle of him demonstrating a technique. And he didn't take them down. He pinned them against the wall of the dojo with one hand in their throat and the other hand at their groin. They weren't going anywhere. Um, and what Tojima Sensei said is there's Aikido in the dojo and there's Aik real Aikido, which is Aikido applied to uh, dealing with real attacks, to Aikido in the street, if you will. So that was another approach that in the dojo, we learned fundamentals that can be applied. Uh, and I found, especially in demonstrations when I had multiple attackers, I did movements that I had never, never trained in. But someone came at a certain angle and that was what I did as a response, which is a, a taste of take musaiki, I would think. So let me just stop you there and ask another question. So um, you've talked a lot about these guys who, who were incredibly proficient martially. Um, so for you, is that practicing Aikido to be prof pro very proficient with martial technique or is there something else that makes it Aikido for you? Well, yeah, this was a long prologue to what I, I want to say, <laughs> um, which is, I don't know. Let me, you know, the tendency is to want to resolve things and say it's this, not this, this is lesser, this is more important. Normally, you get all the critiques of Aikido as the martial is more important and Aikido is lesser. Uh, some you get spiritual teachers who say the spiritual is important, the martial is lesser. I remember from my studies of yoga, and I spent years meditating, um, there's the notion of friction in yoga, that discipline causes friction. I forget the Sanskrit word, it's been years. Um, 
And it's the friction that does it, that develops you. It's not, it, you know, it's not meant to be easy. Um, my, my old Jungian analyst, whenever I would, you know, deal with trauma and pain in my life, he would look at me and say, Bob, you see, don't run from the pain. That's what, that's what develops your soul. He knew me very well. Um, but I, I really think somehow we're called to take the two of them and not solve it, but stay with the paradox. How can I be, I think it's easy relatively to say, well, when somebody's throwing a punch at me, especially if it's only in my stomach, not at my face, I can stay calm, I can move. That's relatively easy. And we can build on that and get better and better at staying calm uh, with better attacks, you know, with more challenging attacks. And perhaps one, of, one way to look at Aikido is it's challenging our ability to handle simulated violence. That's not a small thing at all. But again, we lose it if we, if we, if we don't rub these two together. Sure. There are too many, you know, one of the things I learned in Japan was when you attack, you really attack. You know, you couldn't get away with, and that's what became in the West typical. They're really good fake attacks. You know, it's like you wait here for a moment. Well, your teacher knows exactly what you're doing. You're completely telegraphing. That's the attack. Yeah. You don't go, oh. and, yeah. you know, and yet we do that. I first time I saw Aikido was, um, in Los Angeles, there was a demonstration. Uh, I think it was part of a judo tournament. And there was a, a, a you know, sort of a intermission Aikido demonstration. And it was terrible. I had studied karate with Ed Parker, who was one of the finest karate teachers in the United States, also very effective. And I knew about throwing punches and <laughs> avoiding a real attack. And there weren't real attacks. It was. And, and you can fake it by going telegraphing and then with a big key eye, it sounds like you're really attacking, but it's not a real attack. Sure. You've got to attack with the uh, intention that you would have if it was reality, but have the sensitivity to be able to stop if the partner yeah. isn't capable of taking it. Well, exactly. And, and there, there's a, you know, you don't do a full on attack with a white belt. Sure. That's my new bumper sticker. Yeah. Uh, you, we, you have to calibrate. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I never forget, there was a wonderful uh, teacher in Los Angeles um, who taught in Pasadena. Uh, and he wanted to uh, try to westernize some of the practice. So he did a practice, Hami Handachi, but instead of sitting in Seiza, he sat in a chair. And people would come to grab his shoulders and he would throw them to one side or the other. And I had just gotten back from uh, a year or more training every single day at home. <laughs> so I attacked him the way I would in Japan and the chair collapsed. <laughs> Everybody else was going, uh -oh. and I went, Whoom! and, you know, it was a folding chair for one thing. And he was on the floor and he was, um, and I apologized and I helped him get up and I was embarrassed. He knew I wasn't trying to show, show off or show him up. But, you know, I think too much of, of Western, I, and then when people do that, they think other people think we're being violent. So without understanding that what we're really doing is teaching. No, no, I mean, and the worst absolutely. thing in the world is is to get you know lead someone to think they've got effective techniques because you've never really attacked them and let them go home. So the way I would see it is that um, you you do have to have this intensity from the UK of a real attack. Yeah. But I, I as as uh, Nage, I'm not trying to meet fire with fire. I'm trying to harmonize that 
and lead right. it to a positive place where we yeah. both think, well, okay, we've resolved that problem and Uke doesn't want to attack again, ultimately. Um, right. and it might be that I have to put my fingers in their throat to, for them to come to that conclusion in the end, but I do whatever I need to do to get a positive result where we can both get up and walk away. And I was just reading uh, a Chiba Sensei wrote something beautiful about O Sensei, uh, about the quality of his Aikido and how O Sensei's, I hate to use the term energy because we, none of us know what it means. Um, but there was a way in which he was very expansive and, and, and there, was, there was no ski because his awareness completely permeated everything around him. And in fact, one old kendo master said he was at a meeting of senior martial artists and there was this distinguished looking old man sitting uh, in the middle of the meeting. He said, that must be Ueshiba by Kido because he's sitting with no ski at all, no openings. And he, of course it was. Um, that he was like that. And then he would draw in that to, to pull the attack. You know, since I talked about attraction and then we come right back out again so that the better we are, even though someone intends to give a solid attack, you've got to preempt it. If we wait for the attack, we've, we've, we've not learned good Aikido at a higher level, which not, none of us may be at. Um, but I, I really think that is true, that ideally you make the connection with the person before they raise their hand. If you wait for the hand to come in, you're an hour too late. Uh, but isn't it a wonderful paradox? Yes, it is. I, I, what's the quality of connection that you're seeking when you're doing that? So what, what, what's going on within you when you're trying to make that connection? Um, the physical analog would be this. And it was interesting because Osensei would call out Uke's like this. He didn't do it like that. Because that would have, you know, who would attack him? You know, come on, run into this. <laughs> uh, but it was a combination of yin and yang. It was sort of like, like, let's see, like this. It was, that was in the movement. I, I'm doing this, I'm exaggerating it. But the way he reached out was sort of inviting you in. And, but yet there was this yang connection. He's inviting you in, and of course, the young connection, the, the both of them were working all the time. Right. Um, and, and by the way, I, when I trained in Shingo, we used a lot more atemis than people did in, at, in Tokyo, uh, which you don't see too much, but it was partly because Hikizuchi Sensei was such a marvelous martial artist. And, I remember having uh, a, a conversation with you where you uh, talked about heart hara and working from the heart, uh, which was not something that I, really I heard anybody else talk about on the mat, but I realized as soon as you talked about it that that was really important, that you kind of had this open-hearted, warm feeling. Uh, and, and I wonder if that is a natural part of what Osensi was doing as well. I think so. I absolutely think so. And... Um... And I know some of you, I'm looking at you, Paul, uh, have studied anatomy and embryology far more than I have. And I, I find it interesting because I've had friends who are somatic therapists of various kinds that as the embryo develops, this, there's tissue that forms into the heart and also forms into the arms and hands. So there's a fundamental deep connection between our, our arms, our hands, and our heart. And if the heart caves, the arms slump. If the heart opens, the arms open. How lovely. Um, I learned this, believe it or not, from a wonderful Indian guru who taught yoga, taught meditation, and other practices, but was a master at um, Indian staff. I forget the name of Indian staff because I'm old and I don't remember anything. Um, <laughs> but 
It's an unbelievable weapon. I mean, we, we're so used to the Japanese or Chinese tradition, we often don't know what else is out there. Lati, L-A-T-H-I, bamboo staff, six foot long or so. And you begin to practice with a stick or just bamboo. And when you get really good, which takes a lot of practice, you fill in each end of the staff uh, you you melt lead and you fill, you fill you 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 have lead at each end of the staff and cap it with a, a steel cap. So you've got a flexible bamboo with a s- insane snap at the end of it. The other thing that Lati does is the practice never stops moving. It's not uh and stop. It's and there there are strikes and blocks sort of like um, some of the Chinese arts where you're blocking and striking at the same time. Wing Chun is a great example. And so he taught us a little bit and there's, a, there's sort of a four move, an eight move, a 16 move. I mean, it's incredibly good. One of the ways, a little graduation exercise, you stand there in the village square and have the kids throw rocks at you and they don't hit you. Um, or, or they throw sections of bamboo, which is probably easier. And what he said, which I had never heard before, is move from your heart chakra. Use your heart chakra to power this, because it's all, you know, it's all hands connected with heart. It doesn't go out there. No. It, it, it's all fairly tight, or at least as much as I learned about it. So it, it may be an obvious question, but I think it's worth clarification. So what, what's the energy of the heart chakra compared to what we might term the one point? How, what's the difference in the quality? Oh, Quentin. <laughs> Quentin, Quentin, Quentin. Uh, I'll tell you something. I trained in Aikido. I did some very powerful uh, Kotodama practices, especially with Hikizuchi Sensei, which blew me away. Uh, I learned a tiny bit from O Sensei, which I wasn't good enough to understand what he was really doing. But I also studied for over 10 years in the yoga tradition with breathing exercises and a certain amount of Hatha yoga. Uh, I had a couple of years of Reiki and therapy working with that, with that energy in the body. And I've now had, um, hmm, let's see, oh, geez. For, I, I became a, um, a Sufi student in 1981. So it's exactly 40 years. How time flies. Those are all different quality energies. I mean, that's the, you know, there are different theories, but my experience is there different qualities. I remember doing this powerful breathing exercises in Reiki and therapy, and I went, oh, shit, this is exactly what Reich describes, which I'd never experienced, so I didn't know. And again, something else happens when I, I do an hour of chanting and movement in the Sufi tradition. So it's, it's all different, which I find amazing. I mean, the Chinese talk about five kinds of energy, but I think there are many more. Uh, and I believe intention and tradition shape a practice. And, and it, it just, my own, exp- and I don't know if anybody has been lucky enough to have that much experience of those many different disciplines. But that's what struck me is they all are different. So I've got to ask you this question. So often people describe Aikido as a spiritual journey, but it obviously wasn't enough for you. And you've already said that you've had quite a few spiritual teachers in your life. So why did you keep hopping from one to the other? Was it because there was a lack in the one that didn't satisfy what you were looking for? Or it's just, what was it? That was mean. (laughs) You're mean, Quentin. I'm not coming back. Uh, that's not true. I love you all. Um, I, I and this may sound in, uh, insanely arrogant. I think God put me on all these different spiritual paths to learn something. It wasn't my choice. 
you know, I, uh, I was introduced to yoga and the meditation tradition of India uh, by one of my fellow Aikido students at, who I met at Hombu Dojo, who told me about a teacher he had studied with, Yogananda, who, you know, his teachings are all over the world. And I began doing that practice in Tokyo. And it was, I did that for 12 years, every day, every night. And it left me. I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. I, I, as someone who did that, it's, it's, again, twice a day, which is what the practice is, generally a, several hours of practice once a week. Um, it left me partly because there were a lot of other things going on in my life, emotional changes and etc. And then I started studying with a wonderful, another yoga teacher uh, named Swami Radha and a Zen master named Ju Kenneth Roshi, both of whom were women um, and who studied one in India, one in Japan. Um, and they were like my older sisters. They weren't quite my spiritual teachers, but I learned a great deal from them. And then I started uh, my school, which we invited a lot of spiritual teachers from different traditions, whom I got to know, and that included Hasidic rabbis, Christian mystics, Native American teachers, uh, you know. <laughs> now, I invited them because I thought my students should be exposed, but probably underneath all that, I wanted to be exposed to all that. And then I met my Sufi teacher, and I was sitting in my office, minding my own business, and he walked by my door. And time stopped. It's not my fault. <laughs> I mean, this presence was so powerful that time stopped. And I really had this feeling that the connection with him was so powerful that he knew everything that had happened in my life and he knew everything that was coming in the future, which seemed really crazy. But it, the but more I got to know him was probably true. And I, I fell in love with him. It's the best way I can describe it because Sufism really is a heart-based system. And it was like falling in love. It was, it was romantic without being sexual. Um, I mean, here's this great, powerful Turkish man. I loved his personality. Wisdom was incredible. Um, but I, I loved him in an almost a kind of romantic way. I mean, my heart opened to him. And I trusted him with my to, to be the guide to my spiritual life. And then he went back to Istanbul and he turned me over to one of his disciples in the United States. And guess what? The martial arts never leaves me. My new teacher, uh, who again, I it was an elder brother. He was a heavyweight Turkish wrestling champion when he was younger. Won a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is a top American fellowship as an artist and was a professor of art uh, at an American university. I mean, it's a perfect match for me. And it was, in, in, you know, but th these things found me. They really did. Um, so I consider myself sort of an experiment that the universe tried out. <laughs> what if we put this guy on all the spiritual paths and see if he learns anything? So for me, I, I, you know, there are, number of things that I, I, I played with that I felt were related to Aikido, not to the depth that you did on all of these things, but and I always found that they informed my Aikido. And I brought what I learned from these other arts back into my Aikido. Yeah. So how have these things informed your Aikido and, and uh, transformed? Well, since it's been now 40 years in Sufism, I should, and it's current, um, it's really holding things in your heart. I mean, really keeping your heart alive. Um, can you can you really love people and 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 keep that attitude and not drop it when they punch you in the hara or in the face or whatever? Um, now it. And it's interesting because every once in a while, my Aikido tends to be relatively soft. 
Uh, I really love Anno Sensei, who most of you don't know, is a senior teacher in Shingu now. Uh, beautiful, soft flowing Aikido, very much like Osawa Sensei, the, the older Osawa Sensei, who was at Hombu Dojo. Um, but what happens is once in a while, somebody tries to block me, to freeze me out, and I just speed up. Not with any anger, out of a commitment to making Osensei's Aikido work, in a sense. And, uh, but I don't, I don't go to muscle. I, I simply, oh, someone isn't moving and I go faster. And there's no anger in it. Often the people get up and feel angry. But you know, if a white belt tries to block, to block me out while I'm demonstrating a technique uh, or especially demonstrating a technique, we're preparing for an exam. If they're too stupid to understand that that's a mistake, <laughs> I didn't hurt them. I bounced them, perhaps. And they get up angry because they were scared because nobody bounces anybody here. Uh, that's their problem. It's not mine. I just leave them with it because I know I'm, I, I didn't get angry. So in real life, I, 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 you, you, did you found the Sophia University or, I mean, just an important, yeah, okay. And if I'm right, kind of the story of that in the end was a bit sad. It all went a bit wrong. Um, didn't someone do something to sort of push you out or something like that? That must have been very painful and personal, if I'm right. How did what you learned on the mat affect your ability to deal with situation? If that situation isn't exactly as I described it, how, how does what you've learned on the mat help you yeah. deal with situations well, like that? Well, guess what? I'm still there. Right. Aikido does work. <laughs> I'm still there. I was, the board voted me as president emeritus, which is president for life. Um, I'm still teaching there. Uh, um, maybe the most popular teacher in, in one particular program because I've been doing it a long time and I'm good at it. Uh, but I also go to staff meetings and academic meetings. They ask me to do the opening meditation to most meetings because I'm again, very, I've been on all these paths. I have lots of tools, mostly back here. Um, but what I felt myself doing is not hardening up, not taking a position that this president was an idiot and probably was a thief and, I mean, I did take that position, but I, I didn't do it in a way that it was would break me or the school. And and what I did say at one point when I said, "Look, we have we have, when things really change," I said, "We have a new president, and your choice is to either work with them or not work with them. I'm going to work with them, and most of you know me. You know where that comes from." <laughs> and I, I literally alluded to Aikido as let's cooperate with the changes we're going through. I don't, I, I would wish that they didn't happen, but as we're changing, let's flow with it the way we would. I, I'm sure I didn't say like, as we would with an Aikido technique because I'd be too crude, <laughs> but that's what it felt like. And it, it, it was, I've, I've been there ever since with all kinds of different presidents, um, some of whom were not competent, but yet their hearts were generally in the right place. Does um, a direct transference of what you learn on the mat into your daily life? Yeah. Yeah, that was, you, you know, and that's been excruciating. I mean, for me, I, you know, I founded the school in 1975. So it's been 46 years. It's been my baby. I mean, you know, it's been insanely successful in that people say it's transformed their lives. Just several years of going through classes, um, all the residential students had to take Aikido and they would complain often. Uh, but in the end, they generally said it was extremely valuable. Um, and it didn't die. Students still get transformed. It's still a powerful transformational technique. It's a bit like Aikido. Like, look at all the styles of senseis, and some of them are brutal, and some of them are half-trained, and some of them are insane egotists. I'm not mentioning names. Um, but it's true. We have that whole range. Yeah. 
Uh, and yet people get something out of Aikido. It's built into the technique. I mean, it, uh, I think oh, since I put something into Aikido that we get by doing the practice, it's built into the way we, we blend, the, the way we enter and turn. It's built into the way we do a Riminage or Kotagaishi without the desire to harm, without the snap. This is a difficult question, which many of us are, are wrestling with. So it seems to me that all the things that you are talking about perhaps have never been needed more in the world than they are now. And yet we find Aikido struggling to generate new bodies on the map. Yep. How do we solve that dichotomy? Do you have any views? Well, you know, there was an article uh, in Aikido Journal about that about how it's, you know, it's numbers are declining and it was, and it was good data. You, it's hard to argue with it. And, you know, when I started thinking about violence, I realized that Aikido is one of the only things I know that is an antidote to violence, you know, can provide experiences and techniques to help cure that. See, I, uh, I, went back and I read Freud writing about uh, the death principle. Every, well, most of Freud's deep, dedicated disciples ignored it because it was too frightening, probably. Um, but we, we have something in Aikido, you're right, Quentin, that's priceless. And I think part of it is we, we probably, you know, and it would be an interesting thing to do to have a conference on Aikido as antidote to violence. Um, because I completely, you, know, I, I, you know, it's like I deeply love Aikido. I spent my life practicing and teaching it. Um, and I got a whole new appreciation as I started looking into violence and the problem. Um, we need to probably think about how we, you know, who we, who we're trying to get into the dojo. Uh, because if it's, we're just appealing to people that love the martial arts, then they may not be the right people to carry the message of Aikido into these new places. Um, I'll tell you one, one I don't know if I told this last week, when, whenever I was here last, did I ever tell you the story about when I, was, I taught Aikido at a conference in Spain, sort of a humanistic psychology conference. And I did this simple sword cut, you know, and you step out of the way and let the sword go by because there's people that never had Aikido. And uh, stop me if you- if no, you not ringing any bells, so do carry on. Uh, thank you. Um, so I did this with everybody. I was the one with the sword. And um, I, I, you know, I, I did sort of do it easily and, and uh, you know, telegraphed. And I did it with more and more speed with my heart in my mouth. Uh, and I do this a, a lot with students and I do it earlier and earlier in the training. <clears throat> but it scares the hell out of me. I tell students that. I say, you think you're scared? I'm scared. I don't have insurance. Um, so I did this practice. And uh, after a few repetitions, one woman started crying and left the group and sat under a tree sobbing. You know, this is Shomenuchi. You know, not even a Riminage. It's, Shomen, it, it's just turning. And she started crying. Well, I stopped the class and sat down next to her. And I said, what is it? You know, what happened to you? And she said, my husband beats me. And I came to this, which was a, sort of a humanistic psychology conference to see what, what I could do about it. And now I know I'm leaving him. I can leave him because I know I'm someone that doesn't have to be hit. That was such a beautiful, profound statement, wasn't it? Yeah. 
I know I'm someone who doesn't have to be hit because for most people, and I know for some of us, it's been a long time, you pull back and you get hit, you fight back and you get hit, no, no alternative. And that's what I fell in love with when I saw Sensei and read a little bit about Aikido before training was Aikido offered, I somehow intuitively knew Aikido offered something else, which is I can, I can move in a way that I don't have to be hit, that pulling back doesn't work, getting angry doesn't work, which are both great examples of losing your center, but this works, you know, staying calm and letting it go by. And um, it was a profound moment for her, but for me too. And I said, I'll never underestimate the power of the simplest Aikido techniques again. Yeah. So we've got this potential for doing unbelievable work. Yeah. Um, there are some like Paul who are really applying this, you know, with, with people who have had trauma. Not enough of us are doing that. Uh, my son is doing it with kids with ADD. Um, he's got a dojo in Portland, Oregon. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just struck me all over again how valuable, you know, sometimes you don't, no one's a prophet in their own home. <laughs> like, well, I have four kids. One did become an Aikido teacher. <laughs> Another one became a psychologist. So that's 50, 50, 50. Well, well, I've got two kids and neither of them are practicing on the mat, but I like to think they're practicing off the mat in the way they live their lives. Yeah, sure. so they don't know they're doing Aikido, but I got in there so Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I really thank you for the question, Quentin, because I honestly do think that we, we could investigate the, the absolute extraordinary potentials of Aikido for turning us on, let me put it this way, this is a, a term often used in Sufism that we could really become real human beings. I've you know, written it down. I, I haven't forgotten it. <laughs> I've written yeah. that down from the session. We might, might have to do something on that. Uh, we, we've hit eight o'clock, just gone. And at this point, I always like to open it up to people to ask any yeah. questions or make any points, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so uh, audience, here you are. This is your big moment. So <laughs> stick your hat. Oh, Paul. I'm trying to send a, a, a flyer for something I'm putting on, which is exactly what Bob is talking about. Getting martial artists to share what we do, not in terms of fighting, but in terms of what is resilience? What is the fighting spirit? What is perseverance? And as a somatics person, my way of talking about the relation of love and power in Aikido is, I, I do this all the time. I say, stand up hit my Joe, hit the chair with a towel as hard as you can in anger. And what does that do to your body? I'm strong, I'm stiff, I can't breathe. I say, feel, feel the love. Think about somebody you, you love and feel that soft opening heart and hit that way. My God, there's more power when I love the, the side of it. So it's very somatic and it's very teachable if we can get anybody to listen. Yeah, oh my God, you know, I. In all these years, I've, I've never thought of saying, do this with love explicitly. Yeah. Well, they don't know what love means, so I give them concrete things to do. Generate this feeling in your body by doing something that, it, that works. I can see when it works. And I say, now hit with love. Yeah. I had one woman who's, who was totally opposed to power. And I said, okay, hit my Joe as hard as you can. And she did from, an, she was angry and she didn't like my power, et cetera, et cetera. Then I put myself in an obvious state of gentleness, kindness, love, and I hit her jaw and cracked it in half. She said, ah. if, I can, if I can hit the son of a bitch that hard, I'll love him. <laughs> That's wonderful, yeah. Well, you know, one thing I've found, I work a lot, I've worked a lot with Musashi's Five Rings and I go through, you know, each of the rings, um, it's amazing how many different Aikido teachers embody one or more of the, ring, the rings of Musashi. Like Saito Sensei is pure ground. He's got the body of a football player. Um, and, and he loves basics. Um, 
and on and on. I mean, we've got some people like like my old teacher Tojima Sensei who moves so fast you can't see them, which is fire. And when I try to get students to experience fire, the interesting thing is they can't. You know, they go, Ugh. and I start talking about, well, you know, you were you were conditioned to believe that as a child, children should be seen and not heard. So of course, it's not okay to scream. It's not okay to be loud. You've got to inhibit yourself all the time. And so I go through a series of things just to get fire as energy out. But then the other thing to move on to is that fire is not just energy. It's there's fire in love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I teach... Um, <laughs> I teach a new kiai, uh, which you feel free to take this ball because I own nothing. But instead of saying, hey, I go things like, praise Jesus. This is for the Southern Baptists in America. <laughs> uh, or hallelujah works very well. So I'm using phrases that are heart opening phrases, absolutely unconnected with Japanese culture, because hey does not do it because it tends to close the heart down even mm. but hallelujah does I, or I, as... I think there's something that's even beyond that in a way i use the negative phrases while pairing them with an open heart to burn the negativity out of them shit wow. parkinson's yes <laughs> if, if you burn the negativity out by embracing the heart and the power and using the negative phrase, you change what it means in people's lives. And, and you can't do that without somatic education. Right. You, you can't just talk about it because the whole, the whole thing is feeling love in your body as, as you say something or give a certain movement. So yeah, we've got this, we've got this jewel. I mean, we've got this priceless discipline that I, I'm embarrassed that I've never fully appreciated probably. Who does? When, how do I get a, something onto the chat? So um, well, um, probably the simplest thing to do is why don't you put it, send it to me, and I'll put it in the messenger group, Paul. Be great, thank you. Yeah, okay. that, that'll be and, fine. And um, as much as I love talking to Paul, maybe we should get another question. <laughs> well, I, I'm thinking we should set up a, a Bob and Paul chat show because I think that could be a good <laughs> evening, actually. Uh, <laughs> we might have one or two more to that conversation because it, it could be a really good formula. Um, anyone else got a question or a point they'd like to make? You, uh, Vitaly. Yeah, finally, I've got a chance to, to talk to you. It's the third time already enjoying this talking. And just what I wanted to say that uh, actually everything I heard from you is really resembles in my heart. And I want to, to say, uh, I also didn't choose to, uh, to get MS and to being stuck in a wheelchair. Okay. Oh, you've frozen, I think, Vitaly, which is a bit sad. Oh, have you unfrozen? You've unfrozen. Did you have any more you wanted to add? Yeah. Okay. I, I just, uh, right now, we are uh, together with my teacher, with my sensei, we are working and we're trying to put together a program for people with disabilities and to, to organize even a kind of a grading system and bring up it to up to Hombu. And one of the things we want to do is to get all direct uh, students of force and say to say some words to the people like us. And what we are trying to do, yeah, all sensei was saying that uh, Buddha should, uh, should always develop and evolve. And uh, it was said that it should be used as a step for developing. To do it, not to use it as stepping stone, but rearrange the stones and to get a special program for, for people like us to enjoy that. And we're not trying to apply only martial arts, but we want to use Aikido as a driving force for development of the people like us because some of us are not thinking about martial arts. They want to do something and to get developed. And so it's very important to use 
what we have in Aikido oh. to give it to people. That's a wonderful challenge. Um, I, I had one teacher when I was a graduate student who looked at our graduate class and he said, you know, you guys think you're so smart. You know, the graduate students at Yale are really better at uh, experimental science. Their statistics is better, et cetera. We all got upset. And, and they said, but you know how to ask good questions. And he said, the secret of learning is to ask the right questions because a stupid question will only give you a stupid answer. A smart question will lead you toward a smart answer. So this is a wonderful question in a way you're asking is how to do this. So bravo, I think that's wonderful. Also, I wanna point out that there are martial arts um, that include healing. Uh, in Japan, there are a number of martial arts include bone setting. Well, guess why? <laughs> because if you know if you're talking about jujitsu, people get you know joints dislocated or used to. Uh, in China, a Chinese doctor would study Tai Chi as well as acupuncture. Um, and I've had my my acupuncturist, uh, his mother and father who are elderly now, both still practice. And he said, oh yes, my mother can still kick up to here <laughs> in her eighties or nineties. So there are, you know, it might be helpful for us to look at some of those alternatives where people haven't separated healing and, um, and, and martial arts. And again, Tai Chi, uh, I was lucky enough to study with a, a, a master Tai Chi teacher and he would say, well, you do this, you know, you, you straighten the leg so that chi flows through your body up from the ground. And if you're fighting, you keep that leg bent so you can move faster. So uh, it, it's both there. Uh, Interestingly enough, and that was in Terry's yeah. Aikido, wasn't it? I mean, he did Kiatsu, that was a quite a big, big thing that he taught. Uh, Dan, did you have a question? I did, yes. Um, you come Bob, close up, um, Bob. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. You're welcome. Um, um, I, I just have a question going back to the two teachers that you said O oh, Sensei had, um, with regards to the spiritual um, side of things. Do you happen to know why O Sensei leaned towards him when, as you said, he became a bit of a social pariah following his outspoken views? Well, he was very charismatic, and it's a great story. You can you, there; it's in most of O Sensei's uh, biographies. O Sensei's father was very ill, fell ill when he was in Hokkaido, and their home was Tanabe, which is at the southern tip of the Honshu Island, and he's up north, you know. And, and, um, and so he left everything. He was very impulsive, perhaps. He made quick decisions when he felt it was important. And he left uh, Hokkaido and jumped on a train to see his father before his father died. Mm -hmm. And on the train, he met a disciple of, uh, of Deguchi's who worshiped Deguchi and thought, you know, he was, could do anything. And he was famous as a healer, among other things. He said, go to Deguchi. That's the best thing you can do for your father. And Osensei did. He changed his ticket and went to the equivalent of a, a sort of a Shinto hippie commune, <laughs> uh, which he, he built, was building his own village uh, south of Kyoto. And I think the first thing that happened is Deguchi comes out and he said, this young man has come from Hokkaido to see you. Well, that's, we get your attention. And he looks and he said, I've come because of my father. And he said, don't worry about your father. He's fine. That was about when his father died. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he and he stayed with them ever since. His family, you know, all went crazy because again they said De Gucci is a pariah. How could you go to that guy? Um, and he just defied all of them and moved in. Uh, 
you know, to this uh, city of followers of Deguchi. And by the way, um, Onisaburo was his, a, a name he took because people hated him. And uh, Onisaburo meant um, as a first name, it was, it was uh, roughly means demon, Oni is demon. So he said, yeah, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call myself a demon. But I mean, his, his poetry was incredible. His calligraphy are some, probably some of the most expensive calligraphy in Japan, if you want to buy it. Uh, they threw him in jail for 12 years and wow. he experimented with pottery. So guess what? His pottery are all museum pieces now. I mean, he, he wrote that creativity and art and religion, spirituality are the same. And he did that in his life. So he was an amazing, inspiring teacher for Osensei. Osensei went with him to Mongolia because he said, I can't, I can't do what I want to do in Japan. I'm, I really want a world religion, you know, teaching peace and um and he said, maybe we can make a world headquarters in Mongolia. Well, they got captured and almost shot by a firing squad. <laughs> it was very, it'd be a wild movie. Um, but he was that close to Deguchi. I mean, they literally faced death. They were, you know, in the same prison cell together. Um, so Deguchi had an amazing effect on Osensei. And I never heard Osensei talk about it or, 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 or write about it, which he may or may not have. Uh, but I know from my own experience with different spiritual teachers, it really does open you, your heart up. It does change the way you see life. And I, I'm sure that happened with Deguchi. And unfortunately, you know, if you haven't had experiences with those, that kind of inspiring human being, it's, it's sort of like, well, it's hard to describe. And unfortunately, many Aikido teachers haven't had it. And so for them, the only model is martial arts. Because spirituality, until I think until you meet a real teacher, spirituality is sort of abstract and vague. Hmm. Uh, okay, anybody else? <laughs> thank you for moving us along. I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Sensei, great to see you. Been a while. Hi, yeah. Yes, nice Jamie. To see you. Yeah, yeah. Really good to see you. Um, yeah, there's so much I'd love to talk to you about about you know somatic psychology, Aikido, um, Sufism, whirling, you know, all these things. But I'm going to ask you a different question. Um, one of the things I find hardest in daily life and applying Aikido is in dealing with uh, we'll call them right wingers. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. seriously, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's really difficult. Um, people who just kind of don't even share a basic sense of, of reality of truth. Um, and, you know, are willing to just distort every word and every everything. So, um, you know, what, uh, and it, I really find it hard to, you know, how to, how to blend, how to open my heart, how to, how to be in that kind of a place. And, I'm, I continue to struggle with it. I just, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I wonder if you have any comments on that. I think we don't talk about that in the open so much, I think, in Aikido yeah. about what to do these days, these very days with people who are just on such a, an extreme on that level. Well, let me reframe it a little bit because it's not just right-wingers. It's the people that beat up Chinese ladies. Yeah. They're not necessarily right wing. In fact, most of them are African Americans mm -hmm. who are not likely to be Republicans, although stranger things have happened. But I mean, we have violence in so many different places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm still looking at this business about, you know, that Freud wrote about violence and it got mistranslated. Um, not understood, but the interesting thing, you'll, you'll love this, uh, Jamie, in particular, 
It was a woman who wrote the first essay on, on the spirit of violence, not Freud. He gave her a footnote, which is better than most men, especially back then. Uh, and she, there was a, a movie called a, a Dangerous Method, starring she, her, her character is played by Kyra Knightley, who chewed the scenery a little too much. But the movie was a disaster because they really didn't understand her. And she, I won't go into detail, but she was a Russian Jewish uh, woman who they moved, they moved, she needed treatment. Uh, she was really, uh, had major hysteria and trauma and from abuse as a child. Um, and she, she, her first therapist was Jung. Uh, and she, she later became worked with Freudians as well as Jungians, and she wrote the, the you know, which is I think a better essay than Freud's on the on what I would call tendencies toward violence, uh, and compared them with tendencies toward love. That we all have them both. Um, and her name is uh, Sabina. Spielrein, sorry, I compulsively try to pronounce German properly because of my family. Uh, it just reminds me, uh, I'm going all over the place now. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't have enough to do, I started another business. I ha I've started a publishing company. Uh, with a, a dear friend of mine who is the best editor I ever worked with in years of publishing my own book. And uh, our first book, I just read part of the manuscript and I cried on every single page. I don't cry a lot, but, and it's called The Cello Still Sings. And it's a story of how muse, her, this woman's parents were in concentration camp in Europe. Her mother was a concert pianist. Her father was a, concert cellist and how music kept them alive which is you know it's like the power of art to counter when you talk about violence where you're literally getting people executed right and left um and she wrote about how that affected her you know in in the way that second generation uh children of concentration camp victims do but it's, it's an amazing, again, it gives us, a, I think, a hint about some of the things we could do, which is how can we make the positive strong enough um, and, and yet not downplay the negative? Um, I think we need the shadow. I mean, I, I, I do love Jung. And Jung said we have a shadow that includes all the violence and all the awful stuff, but includes creativity. It includes the power to resist real, you know, evil as well. If you don't have that, you, you don't understand the, the, the real force of love. And, and we've got to learn that in ourselves. We've got to learn how to teach it. And it may be that somehow combining art with Aikido, I just thought about this. Uh, the book is, I don't know when, when the book is going to come out within probably six months. Um, and I will, through Quentin, I'll let you all know when we start publishing more things. But this is called The Cello Still Sings. And I, can, I almost can't talk about it without crying. It's just such a powerful piece. Lovely. Yeah. Definitely wanna, I want to um, tie that back. And I, the book Sorry, I'm just I'll cry. <laughs> I've just been reading like First Transport of Women to Auschwitz and yeah, amazing yeah. stuff. Um, and I'm thinking about Don Levine and uh, Viola Doe. I Paul me uh, Robert uh, his viola do stuff. Um, but uh, just to go back to O Sensei, uh, to tie it back this question since you brought up the, uh, this woman, uh, I remember hearing that in the conversation about how come uh, women could wear a hakama at fifth Q and men had to wait till showdown and you know there's varying uh, you know theories on that or whatever. But one I heard was the um, the the idea that not just a, you know, cover up women's legs and that sort of thing, but that 
Oh, since they felt that women more naturally have a, that tendency or towards, towards love or flow or empathy, understanding, and men really need training, at least till Shodan to begin to kind of train that sensibility. I wonder if you heard that or what, if you have any, anything to share on Oh Sensei's sense I, of, of men well, and women or. Yeah, I, I did. <clears throat> I think I did read that in a, you know, an interview with one of Oh Sensei's old students. Uh, I'm not sure I believe it totally uh, because, I, you know, I think in Japanese culture for women to wear a traditional keiko gi might be considered too revealing. Mm -hmm. That I mean, if you think about a kimono, you, you really got your, your genitals, your butt fairly well covered, whereas... <coughs> they're somewhat more exposed with a gi. So I think Osensei aesthetically found it, you know, almost too inappropriate for women to wear that. I mean, if you think about it up until the modern day, women never wore clothing like that. It was always a, a kimono of some sort. So um, I, my, uh, for whatever reason, and I, you know, uh, having lived there long enough, I think I do have some sense of Japanese thinking, a lot of which is not explained uh, or explicated. It's do, you, do you think that O-sensei had some, or his sort of feminine side, should we say, or whatever, with his sense of, of flow and love, connection, his emphasis, so that that just so happened to be, it, it really didn't have anything to do yeah. with that? Well, one thing, you know, I, I, uh, I Too don't- Too much to call him a feminist. <laughs> one thing I don't mention much is when I was, I had a few days in Iwama with O-sensei uh, and I got to know his wife a little. She was an extraordinary human being. Mm -hmm. It was hotter than hell and she would put her around the house in the dojo and then she would say, I'm going to go talk to the plants. And they had a large garden. It was, you know- um, large garden for us, a uh, small, um, almost farm for Japan. And she would go out and weed and water. But she phrased it as, I'm going to go talk to the plants. And they had this wonderful relationship. Um, there was clearly love and blending and caring uh, in that, that... Um, and I don't know if other people really have written about it or talked about it, but that's what I observed. I was there three, four days and part of the family in a way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think Osensei had a feminine side <laughs> for sure. I'm very mindful of the time. Demetra, you had something you wanted to say. If it's going to be a quick one, then please offer it. And if it's maybe a bit not longer, then perhaps not. Your, your choice. Yes, hello. Hi. Thank you. Well, going back to the subject of between violence and love that you had mentioned, um, you talked about the element of fire and uh, love some time before, about 10 minutes ago. And it just struck me because remind me that um, often people um, think that a really straightforward young style punch, they tend to affiliate it with uh, violence. And it was very revealing when once it, my teacher was saying that it is as if you're offering a bunch of flowers to somebody. You just go straight forward with your heart. And this is just pure expressive of fire energy that is not necessarily uh, uh, violence, it could be love. And that made a um, Buddhist participant in a seminar mm. to, to really change his posture because as long as he was trying to punch, uh, he in his mind, he thought that punching and chiki is, is violence. And when somebody said it's like offering flowers, you know, then he was able to do it. He was able, yeah. his body movement changed. All in two seconds, in two seconds, he could do the movement with straightforward energy. Wow. 
Yeah. Well, it reminds me of um, there's a picture of Osensei, and this is out of the collection of Henry Kono, who trained with me in in Tokyo. Uh, there's a picture of Osensei where he's doing this. So there's there's in a way the horizontal yang, but there's a connection with heaven at the same time, and they're both powerful. And then I'm reminded the statue of Osensei at Tanabe is not a punch. He's re this has a beautiful combination of yin and yang. As I said, as people he called people out, there was also this draw. But this there's a spiral through the oh. arms. There, you know, the, it's it's a it's it's yang. Also, ideally, you do it with a with the heart open. Uh, and so I, you know, I think we may want to work more with poses like that because, you know, I also believe the whole notion of mudras in India is that certain poses move energy through you, which also move certain emotions through you or make available. And this is a very powerful one that we don't use enough. And, you know, I mean, when I do, I tell you when I use it, I use it in Taino Henko. So I, I make sure that people have that position. Whereas I've seen a, a number of senior Aikidos do that, you know, which is unbalanced, you know, but there's, they're so let me, you know, let me be martial, but this is, this is very different. I think we, I think you're right. That would be part of the new Aikido. I just made up a name. Uh, <laughs> which is an Aikido that would, would, would address issues of both love and violence yeah. in us. Because I, I think the first thing is to, you know, acknowledge that that's, we have them. We have both of them, yeah. love and violence or eros, uh, you know, life, uh, life drives, life tendencies, which is not instinct, uh, as, as well as destructive drives. Um, so, you know, can we, can we learn to use certain positions, you know, certain body postures and learn how they feel and learn how that's a response? I mean, to a katate tori grab, that's a, you know, can we, can we see it as more than just a jujitsu response? Can we see it as a more profound response that maybe includes uke and nage together or whatever? Uh, I'm sorry, I could go on and on in my incohate way. Well, perhaps we perhaps we we should follow up, and and maybe I can work with you to create a panel where we can explore Aikido as an antidote to violence. That might be a really interesting session. Um, I think I fear we we kind of probably should call it to a day, a day for today. Um, I just want to really thank you for your your dedication. Over so many years, your curiosity and openness to explore and bring new stuff back to Aikido and then your generosity to share it with us. Um, I'm sure I'm, I speak for us all. When I, you know, just a big thank you. Well, for being here. Thank, thank you for making this possible, Quentin, and continuously bringing us, including me, back on track. <laughs> uh, and thank you all, all you participants, because I find... You, you pull interesting things out of me, which I hadn't anticipated. So that's a wonderful gift I've received from you. Thank you. It's been rich, which is no less than I expected. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to see you, Jamie. Paul, yeah, great to see you, Zente. All the rest yeah. of you. Thank you. Really good to see you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, bye. Bye, everyone. See you all next week. More later. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Bye. -bye.